Rosalie walked tiredly through the deserted streets of the luxury residential area. She had chosen a difficult job for herself. She was a primary care physician. But she liked her job. She had always wanted to become a doctor since the day when her young and happy mother, who loved Rosalie so much, became the victim of a ridiculous medical error. Rosalie didn't remember her mother very well. Only her loud laugh, her blonde curls, and her little pearl earrings. But she remembered her grandmother, wiping her tears by the grave and tightly, almost painfully, squeezing her granddaughter's small palm. Don't worry, sweetheart. I will take care of Rosalie. Don't worry and sleep well, my dear, her grandmother kept saying, and for some reason, she didn't want to go home. Her grandmother was a person who always kept a promise, and this time, with the help of the Almighty, she kept her promise. It wasn't easy for grandma, but she managed to work, do the household chores, take her granddaughter to various activities, and read long fairy tales before bedtime. Moreover, Grandma made up all these fairy tales herself. Rosalie never ceased to be amazed her grandmother had no special talents, but the fairy tales were fantastic, kind, and unique. When Rosalie grew up, she tried to persuade her grandmother to write everything down, but she only said, Oh, don't bother me, I don't remember any of the fairy tales I told you. While you're telling a fairy tale, it's alive, but after that, there's nothing to remember it's gone back to where it came from. Rosalie loved her grandmother very much and realized how hard it was for her to be both mother and grandmother at the same time. So she always tried not to cause any trouble. She studied diligently because from the very first days of school, she had heard that only those who had very good knowledge and grades were accepted to the medical university because there are always far more people who want to become doctors than universities can accept. Helping her grandmother at home was also a pleasure. Cooking was accompanied by a description of the cooking process, no less fascinating than bedtime stories. And during cleaning, Grandma always told the stories of all the things in the house and the people with whom they were connected. Despite good grades, Rosalie spent the last two years in night school, working part-time as a lab assistant at the medical school, so that by the time she entered the university she would already have work experience and thus increase her chances of being accepted to the best medical university. And the girl succeeded, she got into the best medical university on the first attempt. She and her grandmother then had a real feast, eating a huge chocolate cake, which Rosalie had bought on the way home. Student life turned out to be interesting and colorful. Studying wasn't easy, but the girl liked it. The beautiful and cheerful girl found a lot of friends at the university, and many guys liked her. The last fact alarmed her grandmother very much. She was afraid that Rosalie would suddenly fall in love, and that love would completely consume her and ruin all the efforts of her precious granddaughter. To, to her life experience, grandmother didn't trust young suitors and would say, Sweetheart, I beg you, don't lose your head, and don't rush into marriage. You've already made too much effort, don't give up on your dream. Finish university, get a good job, and then you can think about a family. You need a responsible and serious manual, don't do anything stupid, be smart and follow your dream. This circumstance greatly clouded Rosalie's trusting and sincere relationship with her grandmother. She didn't want to upset her dearest person, but she couldn't ignore Joshua's attention. He was the most handsome and popular guy at the university, and he started courting Rosalie recently. How could she remain indifferent when the guy sang romances to her right in the university building, gave her favorite sweets and flowers, and told her stories about the sea, which Rosalie loved so much? They quickly found a common language and spent almost all their free time together. Rosalie wanted to tell her grandmother about her wonderful love, but she was afraid to ruin her first happiness. However, it was extremely difficult for the sincere and honest girl to lie and hide it from her granny, so she decided to confess everything in the third year of her studies. Joshua invited her home on his birthday and introduced her to his parents. The dinner went very well. Joshua's parents were polite and friendly, and Rosalie was insanely happy. 
and she realized it was time to invite Joshua home and introduce him to her grandmother. So she caught a moment, hugged her dear granny, and whispered, Grandma, I have some news for you. What is it? The grandmother immediately felt along. There is a guy at my university who loves me very much. And I love him too. He has already introduced me to his parents. Everything went very well. I want you to meet him too. Can I invite him to dinner on Sunday? I knew it would happen. Grandma shook her head. Well, what can I do? Since he already introduced you to his parents, take him here, I'll make apple pie. Let's see what kind of guy could make your eyes sparkle like that. On Sunday, Joshua was standing on the doorstep with two bouquets of bright red roses for Rosalie and for her grandmother. He bought her favorite chocolate cake and looked flawless. Her grandmother was wearing a long, elegant skirt and put on a vintage brooch on her blouse for the occasion. Joshua was showering them with compliments. Granny was smiling, the cake was delicious, and the apple pie was even better. Everything was going just fine, but Rosalie, who knew her grandmother very well, could see that she didn't like her boyfriend. When the dinner was over and Joshua left, the girl approached her grandmother, who was cleaning the table, and hugged her by the shoulders. Grandmother, tell me honestly, why you didn't like Joshua? Grandma, after hesitating a little with her answer, sighed and confessed. Darling, I don't believe him. He is a good boy. He is smart, well-mannered, and educated. But he doesn't look like a reliable manual you need someone you can rely on. Someone who wouldn't leave you in a difficult situation. He's handsome and funny, I understand why you fell in love with him. But with a guy like that, you'll have to solve all your problems on your own. Grandma, everything will be fine. Rosalie replied confidently, picking up a tray of dirty dishes from the table. Despite her grandmother's fears, Joshua didn't leave his beloved, and after graduation, he immediately proposed to her. Granny was pleasantly surprised, and didn't even try to dissuade Rosalie. Maybe her life disappointments had made her prejudiced, and this young man would turn out to be more serious and reliable than it seemed at first glance. At first, everything was going great in the young family. Rosalie made a delicious cake for every holiday and tried to please her husband in every possible way. Joshua gave his wife perfume and flowers and made pleasant surprises. But when their daughter Anne was born, the family faced harsh everyday life with sleepless nights, constant laundry, and other household problems. Joshua was no longer the center of Rosalie's universe, and that made him frustrated. It seemed to him that now their daughter, who always needed something, took all the attention and love of his wife. Granny was right. Joshua failed to become a mature and responsible head of the family. At first, he became capricious, like a spoiled child. And then he stopped coming home at night, justifying himself with night shifts and part-time jobs. However, there was no extra money, but there was a light trail of female perfume on his shirt text messages at night, and mutual coldness. Rosalie quickly understood everything but didn't show it. She realized that Joshua, who was used to everyone's attention, was now lacking the attention of his wife. Crying at night, she hoped that her husband would finally grow up, bond with their child, and everything would gradually improve. But her hopes were not fulfilled. One day Joshua came home gloomy and drunk. Taking a suitcase out of the closet, he began to pack his belongings. Rosalie, with their daughter in her arms, stopped silently in the doorway. Joshua looked at his wife and said irritably, Yes, Rosalie, I'm leaving. I'm leaving like a real man, with only one suitcase. I'm sorry, but this isn't the life I wanted. I knew it was gonna end up like that right after you got pregnant. I tried. I didn't force you to terminate the pregnancy. We got married, even though it wasn't in my plans at the time. But I can't live like this anymore. I'm sorry, but I'm not ready to fully devote myself to the rigors of family life. I hope you will understand. Indeed, grandmother was right. Rosalie remembered her words. Life cannot be only a holiday. Grandmother is never wrong. 
I wish I had listened to her, but aloud she said only, thank you for being honest. And she left for another room with Anne. After her has been left, it was unbearable to stay in the apartment, and Rosalie returned to her grandmother. Granny only said one phrase. If the husband left his wife, it is unknown who will be happier eventually, and she didn't comment on the situation, fully devoting herself to ends of bringing. Lullabies and fairy tales sounded in their small house again. When Anne turned three, Rosalie started working and everything was great until her grandmother's life was taken away by disease. Now Rosalie had to hire a babysitter for Anne and work extra shifts to afford it. The right house suddenly appeared from the corner, as if it had jumped out. Perhaps it seemed so because, unlike the other houses, it was not hidden behind dense trees and high fences. It was a beautiful house with large windows and a glass veranda full of tropical plants. Why would the owner need a primary care physician? Judging by the house, he has a personal doctor, a personal lawyer, and a personal driver. Sighing, Rosalie pressed a button near the low gate, and it opened instantly to let her inside. The patient, a man in his fifties, really had a severe fever, and the typical antipyretics couldn't help. After examining the man and checking his lungs, Rosalie filled a syringe with medicine and gave him an injection. It was just a bad flu. She sat down to write the necessary prescriptions, noticing that the man was staring at her. After a while, he said, You seem to be a good doctor and a decent person. Can I ask you to come to my house every day? Of course, I'll pay good money. You see, due to certain circumstances, I no longer trust even my personal doctor and private doctors in general. I need someone who's not connected to anyone in my circle. It seems to me you don't mind to get some extra money, considering that Rosalie had a lot of debts to pay off and she really needed the money. She immediately said yes. And who would refuse to earn a five-day salary for just one visit? While they negotiated the treatment and the time of visits, the fever began to subside. The patient's forehead was covered with sweat, and he finally felt much better. Rosalie began to wipe away the sweat with a handkerchief, and at that moment a young woman, nearly her age, entered the room. Darling, you have such a caring nurse, and most importantly, a pretty one, she said, looking contemptuously in Rosalie's direction with her huge almond-shaped eyes. This is not a nurse, but a physician from the hospital, the man corrected her. She will be visiting me daily from now on. This is my wife, Rebecca, he addressed Rosalie. The physician felt extremely uncomfortable under the drilling gaze of the beautiful eyes and hurriedly ended the visit. Brian, your fever has subsided a bit. Here's my phone number. Call me any time. I have to go. It's getting dark outside. My driver will take you home, Brian replied in a voice that didn't tolerate any objections. He'll drive you here, and then drive you back home. Rebecca, inform Max about it, and walk the doctor to the call. Rebecca glared angrily at her husband, but obediently headed for the exit, showing the way. Why is she so mad? Rosalie thought. Is she jealous? But she's half the age of her husband. She's even younger than me. I'm not even mentioning her beauty. But she doesn't care much about her husband. She didn't even ask about his health. Yeah, rich people are even more lonely than the poor. At least the poor don't have to deal with daily lies, pretense, and fake love and friendliness. The philosophical thoughts were interrupted by a silver car pulling up to the porch. The athletic guy opened the door wide, inviting Rosalie to get in, and Rebecca went into the house without even saying goodbye. The next day, the silver car drove her to Brian's house. The fever had subsided a little, but the patient was still very weak. Rosalie noticed that the patient was glad to see her, and thankfully Rebecca wasn't at home that day. Please stay for a couple of minutes, Brian asked when the necessary examination was over. I can lose my mind in this enforced idleness. I don't think your wife would be happy about that, Rosalie said cautiously. Rebecca, come on. She's already achieved her main goal. She's got the money. But my health is something I can only discuss with you, and I don't think my wife is very concerned about it. You'll be fine. 
You just have a bad flu and you didn't start treatment in time. That's why you felt so bad. But if you stay in bed and don't rush into the abyss of urgent work, you can avoid complications. Unfortunately, I don't have any abyss of work right now. And I don't like to be sick because there's no one to take care of me. People only need me when they can get some benefits out of me. Brian said frustratedly, don't be sad. Rosalie suddenly felt very sorry for this strong and obviously very lonely man. Our children and our grandchildren will always need us and take care of us. My grandmother died recently, and it's like a part of me died with her. I don't have any children or grandchildren. Brian frowned. Okay, I've already stolen a lot of your time. Thanks for everything, and see you tomorrow. Having received her first payment. Rosalie decided to make a little holiday for her daughter and, stopping by the supermarket, brought home a bag of grapes, bananas, juice, and Anne's favorite almond cakes. She placed the goodies on the table, put a small teddy bear among them, and called her daughter to the table. And, come here, you and I have a holiday today. Anne ran into the room and opened her eyes wide with excitement. Mommy, did you treat Santa Claus today at the hospital? Almost. Rosalie smiled and looking at her daughter's radiant face suddenly thought sadly. Brian doesn't have such happy moments in his life, and probably never will. The next day, Brian laughed like a child, imagining himself in a rad hat, with a white beard and a bag of presents. He clearly wasn't feeling well, but he cheered up and even tried to make jokes. Rosalie could clearly see his total loneliness and lack of opportunity to be himself with anyone. Also, she was not happy with his tests, indicating some intoxication or inflammatory process. But the patient flatly refused to be hospitalized for a proper examination. I'll definitely die in the hospital, he said glumly, as they say, at home. Even the walls help you to recover, not daring to incest. Rosalie prescribed him IVs to relieve intoxication and improve metabolism. With the IVs, he got better. Brian felt revitalized and had a better appetite, though his strength was still very slow to return. Rosalie also gave him vitamins. The patient joked, Dear, it seems like you're going to make a young boy out of me. In this case, I'll go back to diving again trying to become an amphibian man because the marine world is much more attractive than the human world. It seems like you've had a lot of disappointments in your life. Rosalie suddenly noted, Yeah, I've had enough disappointments. It seems that money gives you freedom, but in reality, it takes your freedom away even more. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You have to check the reliability of your partners and be prepared for double dealing behind your back and betrayal from people you trust. You must go out not with old friends, but with the right people. You have no right to show your feelings and emotions. You must always be in good shape and never forget that the vast majority of people are only interested in your money, not you. When you are young, you can easily cope with this. But when you get old, you must either become heartless or lose faith in people. But I failed at both. My youthful romanticism and sincerity were too vigorous to burn out. I apologize for bringing up such a frank subject. Rosalie said with embarrassment, I didn't mean to be rude. You weren't, Brian replied. Actually, I was the one who started talking about it. I find it very easy and comfortable to talk to you. You remind me of my old friend who used to understand me even without words. By the way, this is another mistake in lack of freedom. At first, due to circumstances, you have to choose duty and responsibility instead of your true feelings, and then, at the end of your life, you have to live not with your soulmate, but with a glamorous companion who accompanies you to business meetings and expertly wastes your money. I'm still berating myself for making the wrong choice years ago, and it torments me even more. And aching compassion appeared in Rosalie's heart again. She didn't know her father, and it was very interesting to communicate with this man from a completely different world. And for some reason, she felt safe with him realizing that she couldn't do much to help him and that she shouldn't get attached to him, she still felt his pain. 
Something real and human filled their brief conversations and made every moment of their talk a precious gift. At the end of Brian's fourth week of treatment, Rosalie met Rebecca watching the unloading of her suitcases on the porch. The golden tan on her face indicated that the weather was nice and sunny somewhere in the distant islands. What the hell? You're still here. Rebecca said indignantly forgetting that it was beneath her dignity to talk to a pathetic stranger like Rosalie, what are you still doing in my house? Are you spying or are you trying to become a family member? Green almond-shaped eyes flashed cold angry sparks, and their fierce gaze didn't promise the guest anything good. Neither. Rosalie replied trying to remain calm. I'm finishing up Brian's rehabilitation process at his house. I see you've gotten bold during my absence. Rebecca pulled herself together, squinting. But I'll check how well you've rehabilitated him. Sure, check whatever you want. But if you were by your sick has been side all the time, you wouldn't have to check anything. Rosalie replied and went into the house to give Brian the new medications. At night a phone call woke Rosalie up. It was Max, Brian's driver. The boss is in the hospital, in the ICU. He suddenly felt very bad at night. His wife claims your new medication is to blame. Max, get the vials from his nightstand right away. If it's impossible to take everything, at least try to collect a little of it in syringes. I'll take it to the lab for tests. A horrible thought struck Rosalie. There couldn't have been such a side effect from what I gave him. Maybe only a minor allergic reaction. I'll do everything possible, Max promised. If anything happens to the boss, I'll kill Rebecca with my own hands. Max, please don't do anything stupid. Rosalie replied, the boss really needs you right now. She didn't even try to fall asleep again. Barely waiting for the babysitter in the morning, Rosalie rushed to meet Max and then to the hospital. The doctor didn't say anything comforting. The patient was unconscious, heart function and blood pressure were stabilized but the prognosis was still uncertain. The body is weakened by the long illness and other unidentified factors. Rosalie's hands started trembling so her suspicions weren't groundless after all. But who could she tell about it now? Brian trusted her. She should have told him about her suspicions. Together, they would have found a way out of the situation. But now no one would believe her. All they could do now was wait to see if his body could stand it. Rosalie covered her face with her hands and slowly squatted down. Rebecca's harsh voice in the ward corridor pulled her out of her stupor. What do you mean you don't know the prognosis? Are you a doctor or an amateur artist? I demand that my husband be transferred to a better hospital. I'll pay any money, just transfer him to the hospital I choose. What do you mean, it's dangerous? Isn't it dangerous to keep him here without proper treatment? The doctor blinked confusedly, not expecting such a frantic attack from an attractive young woman. He couldn't say a word and just waited for her to shut up. Probably she decided to kill him by transporting him to another hospital, Rosalie thought and rushed to defend the doctor. Don't you dare yell at the doctor. The doctor eyes right. Transportation can just kill Brian. All the necessary measures have been taken. What's needed is time and good care. Well, well, there you are. Rebecca looked at Rosalie. How dare you come to this hospital and lecture me? What are you doing here? Have you decided to finish your dirty plan? Maybe this doctor is in cahoots with you. You're crazy. Rosalie replied sternly and headed for the exit, no longer listening to the accusations. Rebecca was persistent. The scandal at the hospital where Brian was admitted was not enough for her. She also made a scandal at the hospital where Rosalie worked. The restless woman was not only scandalous, but also powerful. And therefore, when Rosalie came to work, the head doctor summoned her and started an unpleasant conversation. Rosalie, we have always appreciated you both as a professional and as a decent person. But under such circumstances, be we cannot risk the reputation of the hospital. And your position, Rosalie muttered. What? The head doctor said, surprised at the boldness of the usually shy Rosalie. You can't risk your position either. Rosalie continued surprised at herself and headed for the exit.
Is the HR officer already waiting for me? Yes, waiting. When things get better, you can come back to the hospital. The days dragged on slowly and were gray and gloomy. Brian's health improved slightly, but then returned to the previous condition, reluctant to make a decisive breakthrough. The investigator, who had called Rosalie in for a conversation and clearly sympathized with her, sadly warned that if Brian didn't survive, she could be in big trouble. The results of the tests, which confirmed that the medications on the patient's nightstand were not the ones she gave him, didn't solve the problem. There was no way to prove the switch. In order to earn at least something, and at the same time to distract from the gloomy thoughts, Rosalie began to do injections and drips at home. She had to take Anne with her everywhere. But the girl was happy about the sudden change. She could spend the whole day with her mom, visit different interesting people, and listen to interesting stories. But for some reason, mom was very sad all the time. Max called again at night. Rosalie knew that no one would call in the middle of the night just to chat, so she immediately got nervous. With shaky hands she picked up the phone, and trying to deal with her anxiety, she didn't even immediately recognize his rejoicing voice. He's come to his senses. He even asked for a glass of water. Max shouted, dispelling her fears and sense of doom with his words. How did you find out about this in the middle of the night? An overjoyed Rosalie asked, wiping away bursting tears. I spend all my days at the hospital I've made friends with all the nurses, Max reported. They keep me informed better than any professor, he said triumphantly. Okay, good night. From that moment on, Brian was slowly getting better. He absolutely forbade to let any visitors in his room. Only the faithful Max slipped into his room one night with the help of a nurse. After listening to a detailed report of the events that had happened during his illness, Brian instructed, Max, we need a professional. Do you remember Michael, who helped us about five years ago when the company was in serious trouble? Max nodded affirmatively. Find him. He's a reliable manual, ask him to find out as much as he can about both Rosalie and my wife. We have to protect Rosalie and deal with Rebecca. Brian was discharged from the hospital two weeks later, and Michael had already prepared a detailed report. Squinting squeamishly, he put Rebecca's pictures on the table carelessly posted on social media by her lover. He was eager to show off his luxurious vacation. You can see it all for yourself. It's obvious. I won't go into detail. As for the medications, the switch has been proven analytically. Since you took the medication twice, the fact of switching between the first and second intake is undeniable. If you'd taken it twice, the doctors wouldn't have saved you. Not only that, you'd have gotten sick right after the first dose. So Rosalie has an alibi. By prescribing you detoxification drips, she saved your life because the results of your examinations indicate the ingestion of small doses of toxic substances. If we take into account that the fact of detoxification of your body coincided with the treatment prescribed by Rosalie and the departure of your wife, the situation becomes quite obvious. Of course, only toxic drugs can be provided as evidence for the court. But still, just in case, I have prepared a brief Rosalie's biography. Maybe you will find it useful. And Michael pulled some papers out of a thick folder. Brian thanked the detective and then dialed his wife's number. Rebecca, good afternoon. I'll be brief. Now you will receive some pictures unequivocally proving adultery. I hope you remember that under the terms of the marriage contract, in case of adultery, you lose any allowance. Basically, you lose everything unlike in the case of inheritance after my death. You've been too hasty, my dear. I understand that you wanted to get everything at once, the young blue-eyed lover and my inheritance, but you should have planned your actions better. The only way you can avoid jail is if you leave town immediately and sign all the necessary divorce papers. You have two days. If you don't do that, you'll go to jail. No need to thank me. Then, accidentally breaking his pencil, Brian took the folder containing the information about Rosalie. 
On the very first page, he turned pale, pushed the sheets aside, and called Max over. Max, please find Rosalie and drive her here as soon as possible. Fifteen minutes later, the woman was already sitting in his office. Rosalie, Brian began without unnecessary preamble. Tell me, please, what do you know about your father? Almost nothing. Rosalie shrugged. I don't even remember my mom very well. My grandmother told me that my mom loved him very much, but something didn't work out between them, and he left. I don't even know his name. I also remember that my grandmother, recalling this story, always inserted the word maze alliance. But I have no idea what she was talking about. Your grandmother was talking about position in society. Brian replied, Your father was from a very wealthy family, and his parents didn't want him to marry a simple girl with poor health. At first, he resisted, but his father had a heart attack. Times were hard, but they had to open their first office abroad. Under such circumstances, there was no one else to go there but your father, and he couldn't refuse. His mother, two sisters, and sick father depended on him. So he left your mom and went abroad. I don't know if he can be justified by the fact that he knew nothing about your mother's pregnancy. Then he received a letter from your mother with the news of the end of their relationship. He thought the separation had ruined their relationship. He didn't know that the congenital heart defect had progressed, and he only found out about your mother's death many years later. Where is he now? Rosalie asked. He is sitting in front of you. Brian replied quietly, Grandpa, and shouted loudly, rolling down the slide right into a drift of fresh snow. Can you do the same? Join me, and step aside. Your grandpa's big. He'll be rolling down very fast. Brian laughed getting on the sled and pushing official, wait for me. Rosalie's light wooden sled followed her father. At the end of the slide, the trio overturned the sleds and tumbled through the snow, risking becoming one huge snowball, and finally fell apart, laughing loudly.